Wonderful. Good morning. Okay, so welcome to day three of the World Creativity and Innovation Week event. This morning, we have the pleasure of having Delaney Reynolds with us. She's going to be speaking about the seas are rising and so are we. Delaney is a fourth generation Miamian who splits her time between the cosmetol cosmetolitan city of a few million people where she was born and No Name Key, a 1,000 acre island in the Florida Keys where her family owns a solar powered home. She is a Foot Fellow and Singer Scholar at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, where she's double, pursuing a double major in marine science and coastal geology, as well as a minor in climate science and policy. Delaney is founder and CEO of the Sink or Swim Project, an NGO focused on climate education and advocacy, as well as its website, www.miamiseerise.com, where she publishes a popular blog, Delaney's Blog. She is a board member for the CLEO Institute, a Dream in Green Youth Ambassador, a celebration of the Seas Youth Ambassador, and sits on the Miami-Dade County Committee of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities. Former services roles include acting director as of acting as the director of sustainability for the Miami Beach Pop Music Festival and member of the Philippe Cousteau's Earth Echo International Youth Leadership Council. Delaney is also a senior at the University of Miami, doubling in a major in marine science and coastal geology with a minor in climate policy. This upcoming fall, she will begin pursuing a joint law degree and PhD graduate degree from the University of Miami. She is also the founder and CEO of an educational nonprofit focused on climate change called the Sink or Swim Project. Good morning, Delaney. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So the floor is yours. Take it away, ma'am. Thank you. Allow me to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can can you see that all right? Sure can. You look good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, and thank you so much to all of you. Good morning. Uh, allow me to start by saying a big, big thank you to Holly Haggerty and Dick Jacobs for inviting me to speak today and to everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this conference a reality. And of course, thank you to all of you for attending and making our climate change crisis and the role that we play in solving it a priority in your life. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about myself, some of the things that I do and have done. Um, my work, some of the recognition that it's received, but I want to start by explaining very clearly that the only reason I'm explaining and talking about myself is uh, not just to talk about myself, but to get up here and to hope that some of you, even if it's just one of you, will leave here today and think that if I can do these things, if Delaney can do these things that I'm about to share with you, then so can you each and every single one of you. Uh, you see, I'm going to share some kind of cool things. Um, but nothing that I am doing or have done is all that special. Each of you have within you the ability to change your community, to change the world. And I hope that when you leave here today, you will think a little bit about that and decide to pursue your passions, whatever they may be. So I'd like to start with a little message. I want you to meet my protege, Delaney. Hello, Hi. Delaney. I've heard yes. so much about you. Have a seat. Delaney Reynolds, 16-year-old budding scientist, somebody who found out about climate change and sea level rise, and she's really engaged and she's really interested and she wants to tell other kids about it. Is it true? I've heard that you are a student of climate change. Yes, that is true. That's very impressive at your age. I go into classrooms and community centers and I speak to anyone that's going to listen about the problem. This graph shows predictions for sea level rise and I show them real science from IPCC reports, Union of Concerned Scientists, NASA, and they get it. A message of hope, a message of solutions. And the surprising thing was it came from a kid. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about my passion, which is global warming and sea level rise. So it seems like that's the trend with the youth movement. Yeah. It's like more and more people accepting what's happening. We have to come together and decide whether we want to sink or swim. Is there going to be a Miami when she grows up? Is she going to be able to raise her family here? Is she going to be able to live here? What if Miami can't be saved? Will you leave? 
if that does happen, then we're either going to have to get out or build up. But I actually have hope that that won't happen. We will be able to solve this problem. I think we have to solve this problem. 16 years old and so filled with promise and potential and hope. Have we given you hope? Yes. Finally, I found some, some hope. We talked about hope. Can we do this? And we came to the conclusion that, yeah, we can. We just need to get kids on board and we need to get our political leaders on board. So that was just a short clip from a TV show called Years of Living Dangerously, produced by National Geographic. And it has two seasons, and each episode of each season has a different celebrity correspondent explore climate change in one area of the world. So in this episode, I was fortunate enough to meet Jack Black, who's a musician and an actor. And we met on Miami Beach, and we talked about climate change and what I've been seeing with the youth movement. Uh, and as you heard, I have a lot of hope for the future, and I'm going to talk a lot about that today. If you haven't seen Years of Living Dangerously and you're interested in learning more about climate change, this is a great way to do it, especially on the global scale. So as you heard, my name is Delaney and I'm a 21 year old senior at the University of Miami. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my work as well as why I believe that our climate change crisis is the most significant challenge that my generation, the youth generations, will ever face in our lifetimes. On your screen right now is Matheson Hammock, a public park and saltwater swimming lagoon not too far from my house. From my house. Um, and if you're from Miami, then you may have visited this place. It's a, it's a very special place, like my father before me, where I learned to swim, my brother learned to swim, a place that my family and countless others have treasured for generations. On your left is me at age two, rocking an Elmo bathing suit and eating a french fry, so not much has really changed. Uh, and the video on the right, this is from the park during a king tide flooding event, which is an unusually high flooding event when the sun and the moon and the earth all line up perfectly and you get higher tides than normal. But this is something that we're experiencing more and more. So if you add that high tide on top of sea level rise, this is what this looks like at Matheson Hammock. As you heard me mention in the video, I'm currently standing on what is supposed to be a road, but it was completely wiped out by Hurricane Irma in 2017, and it's actually still undergoing construction to be rebuilt. Because of the incessant flooding that the park is experiencing, it continues to wash it away, regardless of the construction that is currently going on. So while Noah predicts that sunny day flooding, just like what you're looking at in this video, currently happens about six days per year in Miami-Dade County, the prediction is that by 2030, by the time that I'm about 30 years old, events like this could be happening 80 times per year. And by 2045, we could see this type of flooding 380 times per year. So sometimes more than once a day during the two high tide events. So if we're experiencing this now six times a day, uh, think about what that would look like 380 times per year. Also, like you heard, I'm the fourth generation of my family to live in Miami, and growing up in Florida, I've split my time between Miami and a very small 1,000-acre island in the Florida Keys called No Name Key that has just 40 solar-powered houses on it. So in a way, you could say that my life has literally been surrounded by water, and because of that, I've always had a love for nature and a fascination with the ocean. And those passions led me to write, illustrate, and publish three children's books on ecology topics based on the keys in between elementary and middle school. 
And it was while I was researching for those books that I started to learn about climate change. And I decided that I wanted to write my fourth book on sea level rise. So I began by interviewing scientists to learn as much of the science as I could, business and homeowners to learn how they were being impacted down here in South Florida, as well as policymakers to see what they were doing, if anything, in their communities to help their citizens with sea level rise. And so the point of the book is to tell these stories um, to peop about people who are being impacted by climate change in our community so that others can read it and try to understand what it's like to be in our shoes and live with this flooding and also talk about how we can solve it, of course. So I took everything that I was learning in these interviews, including the fact that I felt that young people weren't quite yet aware of the magnitude of what was happening or what we needed to do to solve the problem, and I founded the Sink or Swim Project, which is a nonprofit organization that aims to educate people about climate change as well as seek solutions to try and save South Florida and places just like it all over the world before it's too late. My goal is to educate as many people as possible, especially children, about our climate crisis. I've lost count um, of how many thousands of kids that I've given lectures to at this point, but if you ever stop and think that no one cares about this topic or, or the science, uh, just take a second to look at this photo filled with students listening to my presentation. This is actually one of three full presentations that I gave in one day where I spoke to over a thousand students in just one day. So kids definitely care about our climate change crisis. That's some good news. <laughs> So another way that I've been involved through the Sink or Swim project is politics. Um, so in this case, I learned about the Miami-Dade County budget for the 2015-16 fiscal year, and it was about $7 billion, and it mentioned sea level rise in one sentence. And I didn't plan to allocate any money towards the problem, even though we were already seeing the impacts and feeling them. And I was really unhappy with that. So I, I wrote some blogs about what was happening and a lot of people ended up reading them and encouraged me to keep fighting for funding. So along with some other children here in South Florida, we all went, we spoke in front of the mayor and the commissioner. And uh, I actually wrote my speech in the car on the way to the commission meeting and it was pouring rain. Manhole covers were literally lifting up off of the streets and I, I wrote a blog, or I wrote a speech that I call Raindrops, so I'd like to play that for you. Hi, my name is Delaney Reynolds. I go to Palmer Trinity School in Palmetto Bay. I'd like to comment on the budget and sea level rise. As I drove here, it was raining. And as it rained, I imagined that there were millions of raindrops falling from the sky. In fact, there probably were. And as I thought about coming here, those raindrops were a metaphor for your $6.8 billion budget. And I thought to myself that just one of those drops is equal to the small amount of money which you are allocating to in the budget towards mitigating sea level rise. First, there was little to nothing. Then $75,000. And I think I heard today about $300,000 were allocated. I'd like to suggest that that's not enough that our community and environment deserve more. And in fact, I respectfully ask that you increase this line item to $1 million, and certainly nothing less than $500,000. What I've not told you yet is that I am the founder of an educational initiative related to educating children about sea level rise, entitled Sink or Swim, my website being miamiseareyes.com. And that through my work with this initiative, I can tell you that children, future voters, and their families, current voters, are deeply concerned about sea level rise. I implore you to show the world that Miami-Dade County is serious about sea level rise and dramatically increase your expenditure in this year's budget. We need to stop talking about it and start taking action to work together to address the catastrophe that our community faces. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you so very much. So I'm pleased to tell you that as a result of some other children and I going out, speaking up, using our voice, the mayor revised his budget and agreed to allocate $300,000 towards sea level rise solutions that very day. And he also appointed Miami-Dade County's very first chief resiliency officer. Later in the year, the sea level rise budget was increased to $1 million, and today it's actually closer to $2 million. Well, that is nowhere near enough to solve our climate change crisis. It's a start, and it goes to show you that no matter how young or old you are, you have a voice in politics, and you can help change things for the better. 
Of course, as enthusiastic as we kids are about climate change, that's not the case with some adults, especially some of our political leaders. Florida's former governor refused to do anything to address the problem, and he even banned officials from using phrases like climate change, sea level rise, and global warming within the government. As you may know, we've had a new governor since 2018, since our last midterm election, and he's, he has taken a different approach. He's actually talked about environmental issues and he's appointed brand new positions. And this has given a lot of people some hope that things would be different under his administration. And he still has time to make that the case, but I haven't seen any indication that he will really commit to addressing the core cause of climate change, which is fossil fuel emissions. Uh, for example, he did create the new chief resilience officer position, whose position he then filled with an expert in homeland security, and who less than a year into her position left to work with former President Trump in homeland security. So. Politics is real fun here in Florida. Now, I'd like to introduce you to my very dear friend, Dick Jacobs. Dick is an environmental lawyer, an explorer, and a photographer. He's been all over the world documenting the many wonders of our natural environment, and he's been a tremendous supporter of me and my work. And since we're delving into politics here, I wanted to let you hear from him about why environmental law is so important. You attended the Stetson University College of Law and you were just inducted into their Hall of Fame. So congratulations on that. That is an incredible achievement. But tell us how and when you realized environmental law was an important subject for you to pursue. I, I would say that what it came to me is a result of the tricks I was able to do, which I started really when I was in my fifth in my 50s. I, my wife and I, Joni, decided to go to Africa for just the heck of it. We had never done that kind of thing before. We was back in the days before fa fancy tent camps that they have today, and so we carried a pup tent and put it up ourselves, and uh, it was a very exciting venture. And then as a result of that, I started to do a lot of trekking. In the early years, Joni trekked with me, and later years I did you know, more on my own or with, with travel groups, photography groups. And, and after trekking the seven continents, it became very clear to me that this is the only home we have. And if we don't take care of it, everything else we dream of, think about, or want to do simply cannot occur. We have to take care of the home that we have. It, it, it's ours to take care of or it's ours to destroy. And I just became obsessed with the idea that we needed to protect it. So why have you continued to fight for the environment and on behalf of our planet in such a passionate way for all this time? Why have you continued to do so? Well, anything that's worth doing takes a lot of dedication. It takes time. I think something that, that, that's so important is taking care of our planet is something that will not be a problem and will not be solved in a minute. We build up a whole society as if we didn't have to take care of our planet. We, we build up a society as if all the resources that are on Earth are infinite, which they aren't. Uh, that all the resources on Earth are for ours to do with as we want to, which they aren't. And it, it takes a lot of mind changes to get this right. So uh, most everything that of this nature that we've had to do has taken a lot of effort. There are a lot of no's. There are a lot of defeats. But ultimately, if you keep at it, Somewhere down the road, you succeed, and that's what we have to do. We just have to succeed in this mission, or we're going to be in for a long-term mess. Uh, along the way, it became quite clear to me that that the future belongs to the young people, and that if I could help young people along the way to see a little quicker, more quickly than I did, what's going on in the world, and I could help be young, that would be the greatest thing that I could do. And so I've tried to concentrate on that. And, and I think there are really two reasons for that. One, as I said, is, is that um, our generation, the generation that I'm from, which starts in the 30s, I'm now approaching my 90th birthday, hasn't done a very good job of taking care of the earth. We've left it in the hands of the young. So therefore, we need to help them turn it around. But the second thing is, if you look at history, what goes on in history, 
culture proceeds political change. Political change does not come first. Political change comes in response to culture. So if we can get the young culture on the right track with support of, say, folks my age, and get young folks involved where they're taking up a mission and going to ultimately have political change, that's how it's got to occur. We get the culture right, ultimately then the politics gets right. So speaking of politics and some of the previous comments that I made about specifically Florida politics, it's actions just like that that have led me to get pretty heavily involved and sometimes even try to circumnavigate politics because of the lack of political action or will here in Florida during my lifetime, seven of my friends and I have filed a lawsuit against the state of Florida and its leaders because we believe that the state is not upholding its legal duties to protect our water, our land, our environment, and the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and releasing massive amounts of carbon dioxide into all of it. Uh, none of us ever, of course, expected to sue anyone for anything but we each believe that we're running out of time and that we have to do everything possible before it's too late and we're forced to watch our planet, our home, burn, sink, and die. And it's actually through this work that I met and became close with Dick. He's a lawyer for Our Children's Trust, which is the nonprofit organization of lawyers who all work pro bono for free to help my fellow plaintiffs and those in similar court cases all over the world. So let's get Dick's legal expertise on the case and hear his thoughts about youth in politics. Speaking of working with youth, we have a direct connection in that way. Um, so let's talk about our Children's Trust. How did you first learn about and become involved with their organization? Um, in the mid 2000s or 2015, in 2015, I should start that way. In 2015, after doing the treks, being fortunate enough to trek to seven continents, I decided to put together a book about my, my experiences called Wonderlust, which was oh. photographs and which was. Uh, oh, no, there we go. <laughs> which was photographs and lessons that I learned trekking the seven continents. And I closed it with, with a story of my favorite philosopher, Albert Schweitzer, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, in the 1950s or 1960s. He, he was a, a physician by training. He was a preacher by training. He was a philosopher and a great writer. Spent his time in Africa at his missions. And as a, Norm Cousins, who was a writer, came down to visit Albert Schweitzer and write his biography, he asked Schweitzer why he had stopped writing a four volume series of books that he planned to write on, on civilization. I have the first two volumes, they were written back in the 1920s, but he never wrote the last two volumes. And what Schweitzer said, he decided that his life should be his argument. And so I decided I should take the advice that I ended Wonderlust with. Because I entered Wonderlust that each of us should make our life our argument. So after writing Wonderlust, I started to look for ways that I might be able to help. And I came in touch with that. Our Children's Trust was involved in representing kids around the world, primarily in the United States, but around the world, and was involved in, in bringing lawsuits um, against state governments and federal governments uh, to help accomplish the mission. And I felt that would be a perfect thing for me to get involved with. So I called them up. Uh, and as a result of that, I not only met our children's trust, but you and I became in, uh, in conversations about this subject. I want to ask you, do you think that kids have a place in politics? Do you think that they have the ability to make changes alongside our legal professionals and our political leaders who are currently heading our state and our counties. I think one of the great weaknesses we've had up to recent times is that the young have not been involved in politics. If you look at who's been involved in politics, it's folks my age. It's primarily the votes are of the older folks, young folks 
haven't gone to the polls and haven't participated in politics. And, and I attribute that probably a lot to our education system. I think that our education system has encouraged people to be good consumers, but not good citizens. And I think it's extremely important that the young folks become involved in, in the direction of our country, which means becoming involved in politics, very young and right. I, I think they shouldn't stand by and say that's an old folks game. It's really a young folks game. And with the culture that the young folks have, which is different than say my culture, the culture I grew up with, you know, and, and it is much more caring about the environment than it was in the 30s or the 40s when I grew up. Nobody, nobody even thought about it in those days. Even in the 50s, they didn't think about it. Uh, if that cultural change and passion of young people to take care of the environment is going to succeed, it's got to be expressed politically. It just simply has to be involved politically. So I would say that all young folks have to get in, involved in, in politics in some way. Can you kind of explain like where we're at with the case right now, what its current standing is? Okay, the case was, uh, you're talking about Delaney versus the state of Florida. <laughs> yes. This is the case that we filed, the, our children's trust filed here in Florida against the state of Florida to, to require the state of Florida to pay more attention to the environment to take care of all of us. And that was filed several years ago. I went through several iterations of complaints. Finally, it was heard by the court, the lower court, uh, and the judge dismissed it by what he called a political question, because he by that he meant that it isn't something for the courts to decide, it's something for the political branches of the government, the state legislature, and of course the govern, governor's office to decide. And it was dismissed. That was appealed to the first district court of appeals, where it has now been sitting for darn near a year, I think. And it's waiting for a word from the court that they, what they decide. We apply, applied also to have a, a hearing before the court where, where we could give a oral argument to support the written arguments that were submitted. And the court denied that. The court denied an oral argument. And this, which means everything is going to be decided on the papers that were submitted, but nothing has happened since that decision came up, and that was a, right now three, four months ago. Why is it that the judges that we've faced here in Florida and perhaps that the Juliana case has faced continue to make this argument that they just simply don't have the power to do this when it already says that they do? Well, you could also look at the First Amendment of the Constitution. We think of the First Amendment of the federal constitution as giving us free speech, free religion, and so on. But there's another thing it says. It says you have the absolute right to petition the government for grievances. If you look at the Florida Constitution, it says the same thing. You have the absolute right to petition the government for grievances. And that's, uh, and that's true. But what's happened is, is that uh, the court has developed certain deference doctrines. Uh, deference doctrines are doctrines which says we're not going to decide the case, we're going to let it be decided by one of the political branches of government, either the, either the legislative branch or the executive branch. And that's what they've done with, with these tough decisions. They, there, there is a legitimate concern that the court should not be telling the political branches what to do on how, on how to run their, their branches. They're supposed to be the separation of powers, both in the state government as well as the federal government. And that's true. But the point of it is, when it's carried to extremes, then the rights of people get abused. They simply get ignored. And that's, uh, and that's where I think we are today, in the sense that the court has become too different to the federal, in the federal level and too different on the state level to allow the political branches to do things which in reality infringe upon the rights of people. And one of the rights of people is the right to a healthy environment. So although we filed over two years ago, now at this point, April 2018, we just had our very first hearing last summer where the judge, like Dick said, acknowledged the state's motion to dismiss the case. 
Unfortunately, the judge ruled to dismiss the case, and uh, we are now working on filing an appeal at the First District Court of Appeals. So our case is far from over, and my co-plaintiffs and I are still very optimistic and hopeful for the future of this case. You heard us mention the Juliana case, so that's a lawsuit very similar to our own that the Trump administration had been fighting tooth and nail every step of the way. But young people, just like us, we have to start somewhere, even if it will be a long and a hard journey. That's how social justice is achieved. It's never easy, but it is possible. It is an extremely aggressive approach, but youth all over the world have proven that it is possible to work with their countries and governments to address their concerns over the climate change crisis. For example, on the top left, a group of children in Colombia have provided our planet with tremendous hope by recently winning a lawsuit in which their country has now vowed to protect the Amazon rainforest for future generations. Another group on your bottom right in the Netherlands won a lawsuit ruling that the national government must reduce its fossil fuel emissions in the country by at least 25% compared to 1990 levels. And these victories have inspired similar case, uh, climate related cases in dozens of other countries, including Canada and New Zealand. So there is hope that this is possible, that we can achieve a great victory for the state of Florida and for the United States in decreasing our fossil fuel use through our governments. Now I'd like to let you hear from Dick one more time as he is coming out with a brand new book, Democracy of Dollars, which is the result of being thwarted in problem solving by government in action when action is most certainly needed. So I'll let him tell you a little bit about his book. So in addition to being a lawyer, like you mentioned, you're an explorer, you're an author, you're very multifaceted. Um, you've published this incredible book that you brought up, Wonderlust, filled with amazing images and stories of some of your travels. I think one of my favorite ones is um, when you went to Iceland and studied the mackerel war, I <laughs> think that's so funny, um, but incredibly interesting. And the pictures there of the ice diamond are gorgeous, absolutely incredible. Um, but now you're coming out with a new book, Democracy of Dollars. So tell us what that is all about. Yeah, the it's supposed to be issued the first week in May of this year, Democracy of Dollars is supposed to come out. And democracy of dollars was really a result of what we have been talking about, of, of by trying to get active. And during the course of trying to become active on certain climate issues and being disappointed in the government's response, I started to examine in some depth what it is that's going on in our politics that makes it so ineffective. And so democracy of dollars is really a comparison of the country as it is today with the democracy of people, which is what the our founding fathers had in mind when they when they put the Constitution in effect in 1789 or so. It was a long time ago. But they didn't see the thing the problems we have today, and or we have a country now that's become an oligarchy that's become run more by money than it has been by people. In fact, we're seeing right now after the last election which had such a huge turnout of people, one of the largest turnouts ever, not only in numbers, of course, but in, in percentage of voting. So there's only one election that had more people voting than the last one. But that's disappointed certain political people. And so they've started up a great movement now to, to restrict, to make it tougher for people to vote, because they realize if all the people vote, some of the things that go on in the country are going to stop. And so what I have done in Democracy of Dollars is talk a great deal about what it means to operate in the oligarchy that we have today and how the court's deference to the political branches which allow that to occur are incorrect and how the people need to speak up in order to get the changes to convert us back to a democracy of dollars. And uh, I used two or three prime examples in there. One of the examples is the Juliana case, which would vote a chapter to that. So Dick's new book comes out in May in celebration of his 90th birthday. And I would like to highly encourage everyone to grab a copy as it is a fantastic book with a lot of very interesting stories and information 
Uh, and I'd also like to thank Dick for taking the time to sit down and speak with me about the case and the role that youth can play in politics, as well as, of course, all of his support of me and my fellow plaintiffs in our continued fight to save our climate. So thank you, Dick. So in addition to being a lawyer, now, why are young people taking such actions to sue their government? Well, the reality that we face requires us to think boldly and to be aggressive. Many politicians are more concerned about protecting antiquated technologies, fossil fuels, than they are about protecting our future. Uh, think about the fact that just recently leaders in Texas were attacking renewable energies for causing the power outages they experienced after the latest major snowstorm. Well, the facts are that only 39% of Texas's power is renewable, and even then that had little to nothing to do with their outages. Their supply of natural gas, which supplies about half of Texas's electricity, seized up due to frozen pipes and a lack of standby reserves. And the power grid failed after about a third of their power company's total capacity, which is supplied by coal, nuclear, and gas, it went offline because demand for heating dramatically surged. Of course it did, it's freezing. So while some wind generators did go offline as the turbines iced over, the state's largest grid, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, said themselves that the shortage was driven by a failure not of renewable sources, but of traditional thermal sources, coal, nuclear, and especially natural gas. So we have a very long way to go in transitioning our society and our economy from one based on fossil fuels to one based on renewable energies. But there is good news. We've gone through a major, a major societal shift before and we absolutely can do it again. None of us travel around today by a horse-drawn buggy or wagon, but if it were the 1700s, then that was the state of the art in transportation and is exactly how you would have gotten around. If it were the late 1800s to early 1900s, chances are you might get around in a new invention called the automobile, just like this one. And I suspect that some of the same people who made those carriages and wagons or cared for the horses that pulled them found new jobs in the innovative automobile industry. Before long, in just a few years, I suspect most people will be driving cars like this one, powered by a battery. People adapted and they transitioned. And that is the exact same thing that we must do in the energy industry today. Luckily, it's already beginning. Car manufacturers and companies such as General Motors, Honda, Ford, Volkswagen, and Jaguar have all begun to shift towards selling products that are solely electric. There's some more good news for our country. After four years of climate inaction and denial on January 27th, which is actually climate day, uh, current President Biden signed many executive orders, four of which were directly climate related and aimed to tackle four different things. So the first one is international measures, which includes steps like rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, which we now have officially done. Uh, number two is domestic measures, which includes the formation of the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy a pause on new oil and natural gas leases on public lands or um, in offshore waters, as well as the elimination of fossil fuel subsidies within the federal government, which is really good news. Uh, number three, environmental justice, which addresses racial equity and the broader societal impacts that the reliance on fossil fuel production have had on certain communities. And number four, scientific integrity. So he's committed his administration to actually listening to science, which is a crazy concept, right? <laughs> um, President Biden also has a $2 trillion climate plan to, ach to achieve a carbon free electricity sector by 2035 and nationwide net zero emissions by 2050. So very ambitious and awesome goals to have. Um, however, to achieve them, President Biden has to rely on Congress, which at this point will be very difficult in a pretty evenly divided Senate. However, if he were to declare a state of emergency, a climate emergency, it would allow him to secure some additional funding to fight the climate change crisis and would actually allow him to circumnavigate Congress and enact portions of his $2 trillion climate plan. Like I said, this is our reality now, and it's only going to get worse. So we need to focus on the solutions that cut back our carbon emissions, as President Biden is aiming to do. A great example of that is solar power. Scientists predict that 50% of the state of Florida's energy needs could come from the sun by 2045 if we were to just start taking that goal seriously. That could happen in my lifetime. 
And so after learning about multiple solar ordinances in the state of California, I thought that it would be a great idea here in the sunshine state of Florida to implement something similar. So I wrote a letter to about a dozen mayors here in South Florida asking if they would be interested in writing a solar law. And the mayor of the city of South Miami, Mayor Stoddard, was the very first to respond and he was very enthusiastic about the idea. However, his one condition was that I, at 15 years old, had to help him write the law. Um, so after working many months together on writing the law, drafting it, rewriting the codes from California to mold and fit the ones in South Miami, here I am on the left speaking in front of the commission and Mayor Stoddard in support of the solar ordinance. And a few months later, South Miami actually became the first city in the state of Florida making Florida the second state in the United States to have a law that requires that any new construction of a house or material renovation of an existing house must install the maximum amount of solar panels on their roof. So while I can vote now, I didn't yet have a vote when I helped Mayor Stoddard write this law and implement it. So if you or your children or your grandchildren are interested in implementing a solar law into your very own city to help make our planet more a more sustainable place, then this is something that anyone can try to do regarding any sort of topic that you're passionate about. It starts with reaching out to your local politicians, mayors, commissioners, and getting involved. Another way to become involved in, uh, in your government is on a global level. So a few summers ago, I was asked to speak in front of the United Nations General Assembly on behalf of the Everglades National Park. And I was joined by about 30 other children, as you can see in this picture. And we talked about a pledge that we created called Our Ocean Pledge. We asked all the dignitaries and excellencies to sign it and to pledge to keep our oceans safe and protected for future generations. So here, for example, is Prince Albert II of Monaco and actor in the United Nations Environmental Goodwill Ambassador Adrian Grenier signing our pledge. So it was an amazing week filled with so much learning from other youth who are also just as passionate about the environment as I am, but also getting to see the inner workings a little bit of the United Nations. So it was an absolute honor. Now, as I conclude my comments today, allow me to take you back to Matheson Hammock Park one more time. As much, as much as I love the place and places just like it all over South Florida, I do hope that the day will come when sea level rise does not threaten our region's very existence. I would welcome the opportunity to work on something other than filming videos at dawn on a Sunday morning, like the one that I showed you earlier. And as much as I love the magazine, I'd be happy to not spend the day in a dress in the mangroves and salt water during a National Geographic photo shoot just to bring awareness to our climate crisis. It would be great to not have to do those things, but I will continue to fight this fight for as long as I have to. And I would encourage all of you to fight with me, to not give up hope, to realize that while we will have setbacks, what we're fighting for is far too important to give up hope. All over the planet, youth are standing up and using their voices to speak on behalf of our earth because we're fed up. We're tired of the inaction. And that's why you're all here with me today, hopefully. You're all tired of it too. And that, to me, gives me the greatest hope for our future. Hope that the youth that we see all over the world, that some of you in this meeting room will one day replace our current politicians and we will finally see progress in the right direction being made. I want to encourage every one of you to continue fighting, to continue to have hope, no matter how dark things are on a given day. I mean, honestly, what choice do we have? We have to protect these special places because if we don't solve this problem, then cherished places like Matheson, Miami Beach, the Florida Keys, the Everglades, they'll disappear. They'll be lost forever, extinct. Our children will never get to learn to swim in a place like Matheson. And that is unacceptable. Thankfully, I am positive that if you simply pursue your passions, if you're willing to truly make sacrifices, each of you can make a difference. No matter who you are, where you're from, or what your challenges might be, you have a voice. And it's my experience that people will listen to you. If you don't speak up and out, then none of us really have the right to complain. 
But if you have a concern, an idea, a passion, I would encourage you to share it with your community and the world. And what I think you'll find is that you will become part of the solution because people will listen. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, please never ever stop pursuing your passions. And I think we have about 15-ish minutes for questions if uh, Wendy wants to help me field some of those. Thank you. Delaney, that was an amazing presentation. So, so good. I really enjoyed all of it, actually. Um, and you are obviously an amazing young woman. So um, kudos to you. And having lived in Miami for quite some time, I am very familiar with Madison Hammock. So it was a nice um, walk back for me to see all those beautiful places again. And uh, having lived there, understand exactly what you're talking about. So it's uh, you're doing an amazing job. We do have a couple of questions um, from our listening audience, our viewing audience. Uh, Bridget would like to know how to start on the solar law initiative. Great question, Bridget, thank you. So what I did is once I learned about one of the laws in California, I set out to basically learn as much as I could about it and how it worked. So there's actually three in three different cities and I read articles about them. I read the actual laws themselves. And then that's when I started to put together my letter proposing my idea to do something similar here in Florida um, to our local political leaders. So I, I drafted this letter and I can share it with you if you would like, you can reach out to me. Um, my email is Delaney at MiamiCRS.com. I'll put that in the chat. Um, but I can, I can share that letter with you so you can see what I said. And I basically outlined how beneficial solar is to California and how it would be also beneficial here in the Sunshine State. And I just asked our political leaders if they would be interested. And once Mayor Stoddard responded and he said that he was, um, we got together on many weekends and we worked together and he and I literally sat next to each other just writing this law. So it was a really cool experience getting to work with a politician and at 15 years old learn a little bit about how to write in a legal way. <laughs> um, so I can also share those materials with you so you can see what that's like. They're also published online in the city of South Miami. Um, and then once we had our first draft, I wrote some comments about why I thought that the law would be significant for South Miami, why it would be important to implement in that city. And I spoke on that. And those videos are also online on my website. Um, and the very first budget or the very first hearing that we had reading on it, it passed unanimously um, with some revisions. So we had to change some things and that happened a couple times and I had to speak on it each time. Um, but once it was all said and done, it passed by a vote of four to one and it became the first law, like I said, in Florida to require solar power. Um, so I think the biggest part of getting started is finding that politician who will support you and work with you to create such a law. But it's definitely possible. There are a lot of politicians out there who are big proponents of renewable energies. So I, it sounds to me like your advice would then to be to blanket as many politicians as you can that are within your area. Yes. Yeah. The more you reach out to, the, the better chances you have of one responding and one being willing to work with you. Um, so that's exactly what I did. And I knew Mayor Stoddard a little bit before working on the solar law with him because he he's actually a very interesting person. So not only was he a mayor of South Miami, but, but he was also a biology professor at FIU. So he has the, the legal uh, kind of point of view, the political point of view, as well as the scientific point of view on the climate change crisis. So I got very lucky there. Um, but it was really awesome to get to know him in a better capacity. But yeah, the more you reach out to, the better chance you're going to have of finding someone who's going to be willing to work with you. Do you think as clearly a youth ambassador that you are on many, many, many fronts, do you think that the youth have a more powerful voice at this point in time? I, I honestly kind of do. So we are in a very unique position. And that is because we are not only the children of current citizens and voters, but we're also future voters. So if political leaders want to stay in their current positions on the local level, then they're going to need us to back them up down the line when we're ready to vote them in. Um, so they are very interested in listening to us for that reason. 
also, it's kind of hard for an adult to, especially a political leader, to kind of turn down a child that doesn't look too great for them. Uh, so we kind of can put our foot in the door that way. So leveraging what you have is an incredibly talented and smart skill. <laughs> yes. That is for sure. So uh, Dagny wanted to know what it was like to meet Jack Black. <laughs> Thanks, Dagny. He is awesome. He is just as funny and nice as he is in his movies and in his YouTube channel. Um, he's a really, really cool guy. We joked around a lot, but when it came down to talking about the climate change crisis, he was completely serious about the topic. He wanted to know what exactly I was experiencing, what I was studying, how I was running the Sink or Swim project, um, and why I was so hopeful for the future. He was very, very involved and serious about the shoot that day. So it was really, really cool to work with him. Um, and we also have a very similar taste in music. So in between all of the shooting, we would actually talk about music and his band and the different music festivals that he played. So he's a really, really cool guy. So in, in that clip that you showed, and, and it was so sweet, and you can see that his uh, his whole entire demeanor is just how he is. But um, he said that he had gotten some hope from you. And, uh, and you had mentioned earlier in your presentation that you also have hope. So what is it that you're most hopeful about right now? So I think the thing that I'm most hopeful about right now is the momentum behind the youth climate movement. So before COVID started, we saw millions of children flooding the streets to demand that their political leaders enforce some sort of climate action by way of the Fridays for Future Climate Strikes that have been happening that were inspired by Greta. Um, and so to see so many kids finally speaking up, speaking out, literally yelling at their politicians from the streets, it's super encouraging to me because it shows me that while maybe today's political leaders aren't always so keen on implementing the different solutions that we need because they're kind of blinded like a horse by oil companies and fossil fuel companies who are paying them to do so. It shows me that in the future, we as kids aren't going to put up with that. We're going to take the actions that we need to take. We're going to implement the solutions that we need to. We're going to transition our society from one based on fossil fuels to one based on sustainable energy. And we're going to replace those politicians when they don't listen to us and agree that our climate change crisis is the biggest issue that we are currently facing and will continue to face. So that's where a lot of that talk of hope with Jack Black came from. Um, he, he spent the week talking to scientists. He spent the week talking to, sorry for the airplane noise. Um, he spoke to scientists, so he was kind of hearing like the doom and gloom of Miami's going underwater. Um, he spoke to some architects who talked about, again, how Miami's going to be underwater, how they need to change the way things are built. Um, he actually spoke to a psychologist who talked about like climate change, depression and anxiety and that kind of stuff. And then at the very end of the week, he finished the shoot with me. And so that's where his little sliver of hope came from uh, with the youth generation and the fact that we're doing stuff, we're here and we really do care. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's amazing. Um, another question for you in the chat. I understand that in other countries, there is an agreement that climate change is considered a reality. Here in the US, there is not a universal agreement that that is an issue. In your experience, are people in the US starting to acknowledge it more as an issue? And do people agree that it is a problem? Are there more people that agree it's a problem or pe more people that don't think it's a problem? Good question. Um, so yes, the United States is not signed into really any international agreements except for the Paris Climate Accord right now. Um, but that's, that's not uncommon for the United States. There are a lot of international legal treaties that the U.S. also just isn't signed into. Um, so there's the United Nations Law of the Sea, which literally governs how you can govern the waters around your state up to a certain point, and we're not signed into it. We've said that we'll follow some of the rules, but we're not officially signed into it. Um, so it's not uncommon for the U.S. to do that. However, what's encouraging to me is that Yale has actually done some studies about how adults in the United States are perceiving climate change, whether or not they think it's an issue. 
And the overwhelming majority do agree that climate change is an issue, that it is currently happening. It's just that most people aren't being directly affected by it yet. It's mostly people on the coastlines who are experiencing sea level rise. It's mostly people in California who see the wildfires being exacerbated by immense heat. Um, so it's, it's mostly like the outline of the US who is most concerned about the impacts and whether or not we need to already be implementing solutions. But like I said, the majority do believe that climate change is happening and we need to address it. So as time goes on and we see even more impacts because climate change doesn't see red, it doesn't see blue, it's not a political issue, it's just gonna impact society in every way possible. Um, as things continue to heat up in the heartland of America and there's decreased crop yields and we see more hurricanes and wildfires and more sea level rise, I think more people are going to start to pay attention. Um, but yeah, there's good news in people agreeing about climate change. Well, and I think that that's a, an excellent, uh, an excellent way to view that, that, you know, we, everybody, and, and it's so hard to pin people down. And I think you're right about the U.S. doing that because we've also protect our choices to not force anybody in. So it's kind of like, well, that's why we'll agree to do them, but not necessarily sign off on it because they want the different areas to be able to make their own decisions. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, and, and um, you know, you said that there's so many things and, and at the end of your talk, you gave your ways for people to help and get involved. But um, I'm, I'm thinking about myself. So I'm a little bit older than you and, um, and a little bit more set in my ways. And so what are some things that kind of across the board people can do to help out? So I have limited, maybe limited resources, or maybe we live in an area that's not as affected by climate change. What if I don't, if I live in Oklahoma or something, you know, that's not a water area, what are some things that, that people can do now that will help this initiative? So the best thing that we can do to help with our climate change crisis is decrease and eliminate our carbon footprint, which is how much fossil fuels we're consuming and burning. Um, and there are so many little tiny ways to do that in our everyday lives. So there's of course renewable energies, but if you don't have the resources for that, um, if you have a car, then you can kind of walk or bike to your work or school if it's close enough. If it's not, you can try to carpool. Um, once COVID is safe, of course, everyone's vaccinated, um, but you can try to carpool so that you're not emitting as many um, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. You can also um, decrease your consumption of meat You've probably heard the term meatless Mondays. Um, even if you eliminate meat from your diet just one day a week, then that's actually really helpful because of the amount of water and agricultural resources that go into um, breeding these animals and turning them into our food. Um, another really great way, of course, is conserving your own energy within your household. So turning off the lights when you're not using them, even unplugging things from the wall. As long as something's plugged in, it's consuming power. So even if you just unplug your little phone charger cube, you're saving a little bit of energy. Um, paying attention to your uh, your air conditioning and what it's what temperature it's set out. Does it really need to be as cold as some people have it? Uh, or could it just go a little bit higher and save you some energy? of course, water consumption. And then another huge one is actually plastic consumption. So plastics are made from fossil fuels. So if we stop using plastics, then there's no longer that demand for fossil fuels and that will decrease as well. Um, so those are just like a few little ways in our everyday lives that we can try to help out. Well, and Delaney, that is amazing. And I think that um, I wish I hope that as you continue to spread the word uh, and do your amazing work for the rest of your life, that it's the little things like that, that people feel like sometimes it's too much and it's too big and it's just not my problem. And you have certainly shown so many people that that it does not have to be the case with just your, your desire to make this a, a global issue, obviously more recognized. It already is a global issue, but um, but I think that it's, I think people feel like they're, they just don't have a voice and they don't have nothing that I'm going to do is going to make a difference. Yeah, that's, that's something that I've heard some people say. Um, but 
it's not true. You know, if we all do these little things, even if they're very small, it adds up over time. It really does. Um, and just really any way that you can contribute to bettering our environment will ultimately better our environment. Even in, of course, spreading the word too. Like if you're using reusable cups at home, you can't see it because my background, but if you're using <laughs> reusable cups, then you, uh, maybe your friend says, oh, I like your cup. And you say, yeah, you should get one too. It's reusable. You just wash it every day. Then you don't have to use water bottles. That's two people no longer using water bottles. Um, plastic ones, single use plastic. It's, it's really about just dedicating the time in your life to make the changes and then educating others. I think that's where there's a major gap in climate change um, advocacy. I think that a lot of people just aren't properly educated about what the crisis is and how it's impacting us and especially what we can do. A lot of people see it as a huge issue because it is a huge issue. It's an existential threat. And a lot of people think, how can we tackle this? How can we do this? As long as we work together, as long as we continue to implement these solutions in our lives, then we will get there. Um, we've seen it with the pandemic because there have been less people driving on the streets, the waterways in Venice, Italy have cleared up. You can now see all the way to the bottom. Smog in Asia has decreased. Just in a few months, it worked that fast. So if we were to just dedicate our time, then we can see how fast our environment will recover. Um, so it's just taking the time to do it. Well, Delaney, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us and not being out in Matheson Hammock, you know, knee deep in salt water, although you probably would rather be there just for fun anyways. But um, thank you for everything that you do for our state, for our country and for our globe. I hope that you continue on and uh, anything and everything that you would like to have happen in your life, I'm sure will come true for you because you're an amazing young lady. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate it. If anybody wants to reach Delaney, you, I put her website in the chat, um, as well as you had, saw her socials, Miami Sea Rise, uh, I think, dot org. Yes. Uh -huh. Dot com. I apologize. Uh, so you can reach her there as well. Reach out to Delaney if you have any questions um, or would like to get further information from her.